Welcome everyone um, to Special Education Legal Fund's um, second webinar of the year. Um, we are, um, so apologize for the um, delay and also for the um, faulty uh, PowerPoint here. Um, we are, my name is Christine Lai. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Special Education Legal Fund. Um, and I am so pleased to welcome the um, distinguished panelists that we have here this evening. Um, we are first of all um, going to, um, we are going to thank, or we're, we're gonna thank our corporate sponsors first of all. Sorry, I'm a little uh, frazzled this evening. Um, and normally I would have a slide that would show the, um, the corporate sponsors. It's a really nice slide. It has everybody's, um, it has everybody's logo on it. I can show you here. Um, and um, first of all, we'd like to thank Winston Preparatory School, American School for the Deaf, Chapel Haven Schlieffer Center, Fusion Academy, the Pinnacle School, Spire School, Villa Maria School, and Hubbard Day School for their sponsorship of the Parent Education Program and this webinar series. Before we begin, um, I would like to share a few words about Special Education Legal Fund for those of you who are not familiar with us. Um, Special Education Legal Fund, or SELF, was founded in 2018 to provide grants for families in need with children in the special education system. Since our founding, we have provided over $430,000 in grants for legal support from qualified special education attorneys and advocates to over 100 families in 40 school districts across Connecticut and Westchester County. The Legal Assistance Program is currently accepting applications for November 2021. Um, completed applications are due on the 15th, the phone interviews are due on the 22nd, and we will have a response to all applicants in the program by the end of the month. If you would like to initiate a application, an application, you must visit our website. Um, the website I will put in the chat during the, um, during the course of our discussion, and you can initiate a, an app, the application process that way. Families are eligible for this program if they have adjusted gross income of below 300% of the federal minimum poverty line, have a children with an IEP, and live in Connecticut or Westchester County. We're pleased this year to also announce the launch of the Advocacy Support Program, which provides up to $1,000 in special education support from a special education advocate to students with a 504 or an IEP in Connecticut. Same um, application process um, as the Legal Assistance Program, go to our website and um, to the program's page to initiate an application. This really would be a lot easier with the PowerPoint. <laughs> the um, just a little um, commercial, a little um, either advertisement for our next webinar, which is um, understanding outplacement. Um, that is November 17th, 2021 um, at seven o'clock. You can register through the same function that you use to register for this webinar. And that one is going to cover the topic um, understanding outplacement with our special education attorney panels, uh, including Andy Feinstein, Terry Bedard, and Meredith Braxton. This was our actually our most popular webinar last year, um, and it was sold out in advance of the webinar date. So if you're interested, please hop onto Eventbrite and register just as soon as you humanly can. Um, let me see if I can find the... Um, PowerPoint because it really just isn't as effective to um, you know talk about this stuff and you guys and your incredible backgrounds and all of the like you know all just you know how um, you know what tremendous you know expertise that you bring to um, you know to special education and to your schools without the presentation which I am just about to find here. Um, perfect. That was pretty good stall, wasn't it? Yes, no? Um, here we go. It's a great stall. It's a really good stall. I mean, you know, come on. Um, all right, here we go. Now I'm gonna just fast forward through all of the stuff that I just went through. And here we go. Um, Beth Sugarman. <laughs> Beth has been head of, Winston, uh, head of school for Winston Preparatory Schools Connecticut campus in Norwalk since its beginning in 2007. Um, she's led that campus for 15 years with empathy, insight, and compassion. And for my part, Beth is a dear friend. I do credit my son's transformative experience at Winston in no small parts of Beth. 
her skills as an educator and her patience um, with um, a younger um, the, uh, the, a younger Spencer. Um, Beth is also a board member of Special Education Legal Fund. And incidentally, she is the first person that I reached out to outside of family and close friends back in 2018 when I was looking to make um, self a reality. Um, we absolutely would not be here without Beth's uh, love and support. So thank you and welcome again. Our next um, panelist is William DeHaven. Bill is head of Villa Maria and we are so excited to welcome him both to this panel and to the special education community in Connecticut. Um, when Bill was hired to um, take the head of school position at Villa, I, um, I actually did a little bounce of excitement in my seat um, because his reputation in the field had preceded him. And we were, we were just incredibly thrilled to see him move from Winston to Villa to carry, out the, carry on the transformative work that um, Dr. Marjorie Castor had done as interim at Villa and really just to take hold of this, you know, this asset in, um, in Fairfield County in the special education community. So we're thrilled to, and excited to have Bill on our panel this evening. He's also a board member of Special Education Legal Fund. Um, I think I have to say that for a disclaimer. And uh, we welcome him both to this panel and to um, self and to our community. Thank you, Christine. Jim, Jim is, um, we're welcoming Jim back for your second um, you know, panel with us. Um, you're in your second year as interim head of Eagle Hill School. Maybe you're not thrilled to be joining us for a, um, a second um, webinar. Uh, maybe, um, you know, you know the, the, I don't know if this was, uh, this was in the plan, the, the second year, but you know, we're all very lucky to have you. Um, Eagle, is, Eagle Hill is very lucky to have you. Thank you. Uh, your wisdom, your perspective, and all of your experience in um, independent special education, independent school education in Connecticut. So welcome back to our panel this evening. Thank you. Charlie Manos is joining us this evening as well. Charlie is the um, interim head of school at Pinnacle. And um, we've been really, really fortunate to get to know and have a deeper understanding of the um, programs at the Pinnacle and Spire School. Um, Charlie's an incredible font of wisdom and knowledge about students with these particular special education needs. And his background in mental health also makes him uniquely qualified to support students and families through what are challenging educational years. So welcome, Charlie. And last but not least, um, we welcome Maggie Gregory, Margaret Gregory, um, back to the panel um, from Fusion Academy in Greenwich. You know, Maggie is head of school at Fusion in Greenwich. She's an expert in small group education and individualized learning. And she's been a frequent guest on self webinars and, and also a longtime friend of both my family and Special Education Legal Fund. Um, we've been very grateful to have Fusion as an, as an asset um, in the community, just personally speaking. So we're um, really, really grateful and uh, welcome back, Maggie. Oh, wait, I missed your slide. Oh, there it is, sorry. Um, now for the fun part, um, the disclaimer. This webinar panel is presented for informational purposes only. This webinar is intended as a resource for families who are navigating the special education system in Connecticut and New York and is not intended to provide legal support, advice, or assistance to any particular individual, nor is it intended to replace the advice and counsel of a qualified special education attorney. This webinar should not be construed as an endorsement by Special Education Legal Fund or any of its representatives of any of the schools in the panel. For participants in the webinar, this panel should be viewed as a public forum. Please do not ask questions in the Zoom platform, either the Q&A or the chat about your child or your child's legal or educational situation. Please email questions to me at christine at spedlegalfund.org. I will put that in the chat. In your question, please refrain from comments that include identifiable information about your child, including name, grade, school, or school district. Please remember your screen name may be visible to participants in the panel, as well as panelists and special education legal fund. The webinar is being recorded and may be distributed or shown at a later date at the discretion of Special Education Legal Fund. So now, special education schools getting past the sticker shock. I know um, all of you hate this title, I think, um, but it's effective and, um, you know, and it, it got some people's attention. Um, I think one of the most important things, you know, as we start, you know, our discussion this evening for parents to understand is how special education programs at independent schools, independent special education programs differ from what is offered to them in their public school program 
or in other non-special education private schools. So what I wanted to start talking about is the student teacher ratio. Um, this is one of the measures that families look at and schools use as a measure of comparison with each other. Um, what does it tell a family about a school and what doesn't it include? Why is it a valid measure of comparison and why not? Who wants to go first? I don't mind going first, considering we're probably the smallest ratio. Probably you <laughs> I don't are. think you can get much smaller. <laughs> um, so Fusion is a one-to-one, -one, one teacher, one student at a time for all academic courses. And the way that we work that is we have, um, we pair a teacher and student. We're very intentional with that. So when a family comes in and they meet with me, I'm already racking through my brain and, and our directory of teachers and making sure that we're starting with relationships first. So within the one-to-one, -one, it's a very personalized, very individualized experience for the students, um, making sure that the students feel like we can go at their speed. So within the one-to-one, -one, we can slow down or we can speed up depending on where the child is. You might have a child that struggles in math, um, but really thrives in English. So the pace, even within that student's program, depending on class, really varies in the mm -hmm. modifications that we make per, per class. Jim? Yeah, what, I think we all certainly could um, agree that small student ratio uh, is, is important. It's part of the fabric of our institutions, whether it's one-on-ones or small groups. What um, I noticed at Eagle Hill, where I'm relatively new, this is just my second year, but what I noticed is a practice that you certainly won't find in very many mainstream schools is the fact that we reshuffle the cards every couple of weeks. It's not, even though you're in a class of three, four, five, six students, whatever it is, that's not, hey, you've got your small student ratio and we're staying with it till June. Um, I was surprised and delighted to see that, you know, every couple of weeks, months, we reshuffled, you know, we moved the deck chairs around and we make sure that kids are paired well. It's not just, with the right teacher, but that you're with the right company. And, um, and, uh, and I'm guessing that that's not an Eagle Hill strategy that other schools embrace that as well. But I think that's very important to point out. It's not just small numbers, it's the willingness to be flexible. I love that. And I think it brings up a good point, which I think we'll explore about the peer group. But um, Bill, you look like you wanted to chime in here. Well, no, I'll, I'll just connect what Jim and Maggie both said. So I, I think that our, our small ratios in any of our schools, it's about the understanding that Jim was talking about, that the, the reshuffling happens because we better understand our kids. Yeah. And we're able to have relationships with our kids and understand them in ways that, that are often impossible in a public school setting. I think if I can pick back off of, off of that answer, I think that you know, our classes are around four to six, depending upon the content area, four more in, in English language arts and mathematics. I think, um, you know, I was a director of public schools for a long time, so I could sort of, you know, I lived the experiences of both large class sizes and special education in public schools. I think one of the one of the primary differences is what you do with those four students, not necessarily how small the class is. I think that um, I think that's the important thing. I think the depth of understanding of students, the ability to capture, foster, and build a relationship of trust and mutual respect, because we, we know that the students who eventually come to one of our schools have usually been traumatized or have had at least uh, a number of, of failures and, and lack of successes in their, in their public school experience. And those have led to a lot of adverse, adverse reactions to education in general, so the capacity to build those relationships, to understand students on the deepest level, to understand them below their diagnoses, uh, diagnosis only is the beginning point, and to build that trust so they can really trust us to teach them and also know that they are teachable, for them to build that confidence. I think that's embedded in a model of the very small classroom in a small school. And I, I think just to piggyback on everyone's statement that that is so evident to us even here in the middle of October, that students that come from conventional settings, um, the, the feedback from families that students feel understood and they feel safe, um, that they develop rapport with their teachers so very quickly because of that small ratio, whether um, at Winston it's an average class size of 10 coupled with our one-to-one -one focus program every day, um, those relationships are um, so valuable 
And I think that, you know, kids are, I always say kids are like dogs, they know who to trust very quickly. And I think um, that feedback we receive from families so early in the start of the school year that my kid gets up and goes to school and wants to go to school and, and feels safe and understood is what makes a huge difference. That's great. That's great perspective. I mean, I think it, it segues nicely into, you know, my second question, which, you know, has to do with um, student support. Um, I know that, you know, coming from a public school setting, I as a parent was very, um, you know, probably over focused on, you know, what I sort of term a, a shopping list, which was like, you know, I've got four speech, 30 minutes. I've got two social group, you know, 30 minutes. I've got PT for, you know, one time, you know, so I was very focused on sort of those slots. And um, I'd love for you all to expound upon, you know, how student support, I mean, obviously you're providing support for your students in those ways and other ways. How is it embedded into your program? How is it part of the day? How, do, how is it like woven into the fabric of what you do? Um, I don't remember who went first last time. Jim, why don't you go? Sure. Um, it, it's, an, it's a critical question, and, and it certainly was my question because this school, the, the, the cost to educate a child at Eagle Hill is considerably higher than ever I, than I experienced in my other school. So I asked the question, why? And, it, and the answer didn't just stop with small to student teacher ratio. It was much more complicated than that. And what I've learned is that at least at Eagle Hill, and I think each of you can talk about this, we, we've invested heavily in a whole team of um, uh, speech and language pathologists. We have five of them in a, in a school. We have about 260 students. We've invested in six um, uh, psychologists and social workers, and they work collaboratively with the teachers. They, um, it's more of a push in than a pull out program, although in some cases students have one to one instruction. And, you know, we've invested in a full athletic program. So I have co teachers who coach as well. Um, we have arts, music, there's a lot we do to try to pick up that full independent school tradition of addressing many facets. It's not just about language-based learning issues. It's not just about the ability to read or write or computer effectively. I, I, these schools I don't see them as, we, we're not one trick ponies. We, we try to do it all and that gets expanded but it's also woven in, as you put it, in the culture of the school, the fabric of the experience of Eagle Hill, and I'm sure each of you could probably say, say the same. Christine, I, I think that a lot of, you know, the services that parents like you fought for in the, in the public school, they're all called related services because they're related to what's supposed to be happening in a fourth grade classroom. Right. And even as a self-contained classroom teacher in New York City, my kids were pulled for related services and I never even had the kids who were supposed to be with me all day. So it, in our program, there, there's nothing related to what's supposed to be happening. It's always about skill and strategy instruction. And so everything is integrated. So the speech and language and the counseling and the OT, everything is integrated into what's supposed to be that program for our kids. And that's the best way to learn. You know, I mean, Absolutely. you know, you can't generalize that not that, you know, those skills that you're learning if you're learning them like over here and then you got to like come back over here and, and do them in another in another place. Charlie, why don't you, um, you know, you know, chime in. I mean, I know I mean, I just recently um, had the pleasure of visiting, um, you know, of visiting, you know, Pinnacle and Spire and what struck me because it's a brand new space. Um, you know, so, you know, it's really, you know, spectacular. And what struck me about the space, and I had never really thought about, you know, this is stupid of me, I'd never really thought about how design and architecture plays into the support process. Beth, you know this too, because you were involved in the, you know, the building of, you know, of Winston, you know, from the ground up. And, um, you know, and how like, having the support in the actual design of the building supports the child. So the child doesn't have to run down the hall looking for someone when they're in a moment of crisis. Um, so, you know, why don't you uh, talk a little bit about that? Thanks, Christine. Let me just give you the landscape of the, the number of, of, I prefer to call them essential services rather than related because, because they're so essential to a child's growth and related seems a little bit sort of like on the fringe, not sort of embedded and integrative. So for, we have a student body of about 70 students. We have four um, mental health professionals, um, three speech and language pathologists, two senior behaviorists, and seven social emotional coaches. 
and two full-time occupational uh, therapists. So there's a lot of these essential services that are embedded in each, and each of the division has their dedicated group of essential uh, related services. I think the way we see it as essential is that we realize that our students aren't gonna to respond to add-on services. I was a school psychologist once in public schools. Going down the hall for an hour just doesn't really cut it because it seems like something fringe and not really embedded in the child's uh, right. absolute necessity for them, for them to learn. So our, our whole philosophy, and we're, you know, we're sort of based on, on this Ross Green a model of collaborative and proactive solutions where we're constantly trying to build capacity and trust and, and sort of understand kids at the very deepest level through that process and then problem solve with them. So they become active partners and advocates in that, in that process. I think along with that, we've also seen the need really to support parents. And that support to parents from a, a related service or essential services perspective is anywhere from really helping parents see their children from a different perspective, not a perspective that sees them as somewhat pathological, but, but in terms of lagging skills and unsolved problems that, that need our essential partnership to, to resolve. Anywhere to brief counseling with families and sometimes more intensive work with families and always collaborating sort of intensively with our outside community providers since the majority of our families have a number of outside providers in areas of mental health, speech and language, and occupational therapy. So it just becomes part and parcel of every of every student. Mm -hmm. I will give one anecdote from earlier today that an outside psychologist who had finished an evaluation talked about the the that with this particular student, the focus on their mental health was going to be primary because without that, we really couldn't get to their access to education. So it showed the primacy and, and, and sort of the essential nature of those services. Mm -hmm. Beth, why don't you, I mean, I know I had such a hard time, you know, coming to Winston, you know, as a parent, you know, from that sort of, um, you know, related service model, because it was so hard to let go of the idea that like, it was all in the day, you know, and it was incorporated in the support that everyone was going to provide. And, um, and it worked, you know, it was, it was a beautiful experience for us. Um, I'd love for you to, you know, to share a little bit about that in your um, perspective. Well, as a speech and language pathologist, um, at Winston, we have several uh, SLPs on staff, but we have several, um, I think as everyone's talked about, you know, very, very talented professionals. We have school counselors, we have reading specialists, SLPs, LD specialists, um, uh, special ed teachers. And when we utilize our continuous feedback system, which is where we assess a student, such as when we had Christine's son come to us and we gain an understanding of that student's particular profile, we then group students in similar profiles. So uh, they're no longer the outlier, which many students feel they are when they come from conventional settings. They're now grouped with students that um, have similar um, areas in, in, in need of support, uh, similar strengths as well. And um, those teachers that I spoke about, um, you know, we look at each group of students and we then um, determine, well, what's the best teaching team based upon the needs of these students? So we have students in grades five through 12. Uh, we have an influx of some fifth and sixth grade students that are very bright, but, you know, are missing that, that, that uh, skill, uh, that student skill. Um, not to, so to, to Christine's son, a very intelligent young man, uh, but had trouble with that self-regulation piece. And, and by that, I, I, I don't mean necessarily behavioral. I just mean, what do I do? And I don't know what to do. Or what do I do when I'm overwhelmed and that anxiety that so many students come with? And uh, once, as I mentioned earlier, students feel understood um, and we respond to that student. And that's that's the most one of the most important pieces of that continuous feedback system is uh, responding to how a student responds. And that's what's so difficult, I think, with an IEP system, because I don't think that collaboration and that team, um, uh, I, I had also once been um, a speech pathologist uh, in a local public school in Westchester, and I was in the resource room. And I realized, you know, this is where they send everyone that has a problem. If your child has a problem, yeah. send them to the resource teacher. And I had a room of 16 students um, you know, with varied learning profiles, very, varied cognitive and, and achievement presentations as well as social emotional presentations. 
Um, and I, I said to the supervisor, I'm good, but I'm not that good. <laughs> Whereas at Winston, it, it makes sense because our, our students are grouped together with similar profiles. And I think Christine's son was successful because we, we worked on both his, his uh, cognitive strengths, but we, we helped to improve upon those areas of challenge. Um, and he was grouped with students and a great team of professionals um, that are very knowledgeable in the field of learning differences. And I think that's what the program is. It's in, everything's infused from the social emotional piece. And you talked about this QSIL earlier, and we can get to that later, um, to the continuous feedback system. Um, and that's our lexicon at Winston. That's how our teachers speak. That's how we speak. And that's also how we, we try to help our students understand that process as well. Wonderful. Maggie? Yeah, uh, Beth, that was so eloquent. I loved that. <laughs> I mean, if you're, a, you're a slightly different program. It's not exactly yeah. the same thing, but you've got that yeah. flexibility inherent in your model. So, you know, so that allows you to be, you know, to, to provide a, an individualized education for students. Exactly. And paired with that individualized experience, so our students are actually only one to one for 40% of their day, where the remainder six, the remaining 60% of their day, they're actually out among their peers. So all their homework is done on campus with us in our, in what we call our homework cafe. It's a very welcoming, very homey space. There's couches and pillows and bean bags, and of course, tables also for students that want to sit upright and do their homework. But we have additional supports in our homework cafe. So our director of homework cafe is also our special education lead. So she reads all paperwork that's coming on and every student knows them very intensely. And Charles, I love the way you said before, I actually wrote it down to understand kids on the deepest level. And, and that's what we're aiming to do. It's embedded into our mission that we're aiming not just to understand them from an academic level, but also a social emotional level. It's very important that, you know, we're moving with them. It, you know, we're not moving against them. They're kind of like a river. We want to be fluid with them and let them know that that's our intention to know them deeply and, and partner with them instead of that hierarchy of I'm the teacher and, and you're the student, you know, you mentioned before that they they typically do have some past traumas that they're they're dealing with and to trust teachers again and find an engaging environment that welcomes them and embraces them is so important. And that's that's where our homework cafe comes in and we embed that right into their day and provide them with all different resources within that space. That's wonderful. Um, you guys are, you know, that's uh, that's a great, you know, discussion and, um, you know, summary. Of them. Bill, did I skip you? No, I jumped in. I, <laughs> okay, I, can, I, I can talk. So whenever you. <laughs> um, so um, the um, I know that um, you know you guys welcome families into your program. You know, at various stages of you know sort of the um, you know the in the educational cycle, as it were. Um, when a family comes to you, you know, I know there's they have two questions in mind. Um, and so I'm going to do the first one. The first one is how long should, should I give you to get to know my child? How long should I give you until I figure out that this um, is the right fit for my child? That's a great question. And I think um, the admissions process is such an important piece to uh, understand, as I mentioned, who is this child? Uh, uh, Michelle Rolf, our wonderful admissions director, and I meet with students, we meet with families prior, uh, we receive neuropsych evaluations, um, we review cognitive achievement, social emotional um, components. And yeah, I always say to family, you know, I don't know. The, the answer to that question yeah. is I don't know. We all had a crystal ball, it'd be wonderful, but I, <laughs> no one's given anyone, any of us a crystal ball as of yet. But I, I do mention, as I mentioned at the onset um, of the presentation that um, I think especially students that come from a very challenging um, uh, ex educational experience uh, and those that come from it, our, our friends in Eagle Hill, that's a different conversation or our kids that Maggie sends to us or, or our, our pinnacle friends, right? Or Villa, all of you, you know, like the kids that come to us, that's a different conversation. But for some students that have had some really uh, traumatic um, experiences uh, academically, I think just, you know, the answer is I think they'll adapt pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. The kids that come from the wonderful schools uh, and, and our other panelists, those kids transition well. Some of them get a little stuck because it's different and our kids don't always love different <laughs> and change. So novel situations um, uh, sometimes can be a little challenging, but I think again, very quickly kids just feel, oh, this is a safe place and, and I like my teachers and my teachers are here to help. We're a solution-based model. Uh, you know, we're, we're about outcomes and, and, and measuring our students' progress. 
and into to their needs. Our kids mature, they're supposed to be, we want them to be. Um, so I think that very quickly, a, a kids get a sense of, this is a place that is going to help me. Uh, just a quick anecdote story, I'll never forget. We had a student, a young lady visit us um, in our middle school pre-COVID, but um, the mom called us 10 minutes after the visit and said, can she come tomorrow? And, and we said, well, <laughs> well, let's talk about that. Let's like see. Like to school? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Can she come yeah. tomorrow? Can she come to school? Can she start? Yeah. And, and we said, well, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that, but may we ask why? And she said, the teachers were so nice. And I thought that was so sad. At the same time, it made me yeah. feel good about, it. you know, her. Yeah. But at the same time, I thought it was just sad that that's what it, it took, that this poor girl has not felt that her teachers were nice. And again, I'm not, you know, speaking about what's right or wrong out in the real world, but I think um, you never realize the impact you have on kids sometimes, the words are so important. I, you know, I think as a teachers and I see the teachers and I think that sometimes kids show up at our campuses and look around and say, oh my gosh, they're, they're just like me. Instead of being in a classroom where I know I am as smart as my best friend and I'm still struggling. And then they show up and visit in a classroom and like, oh my gosh, everyone's like me. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean everything's perfect. You know, I'll give you a, a, the opposite example. I, you know, we're six weeks into school. I have a little fourth grader who, 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 who really, he struggles terribly with decoding. He may always struggle with decoding. And, and he was upset today. We, again, like Jim talked about, we, we shuffle the deck. We, we're always trying to make our best decisions. The more we learn about our kids, the different decisions we make. And we made a move and, and he said, I just don't like it here. I can't do this. You, you, there's, there's too much change. And give me three reasons why this is a good school. And, so, <laughs> you know, and it was great. And then I yeah. did. And he goes, oh, and then he went to class. But, if, you know, this, this is a little man who's, who's nine, who, who has learned not to trust yeah. school because yeah. he, because he's a smart kid who's a struggling reader. Um, and so we're working really hard. So it's, it's, you get both. You really do. Yeah. You know, to the door. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have anything incredibly original to add to what Beth and Bill just said, because I think they're right. Beth, you're right. It, it's not as long as a, as a parent might imagine. Uh, to adjust to our schools. Bill, you're right. They're looking for, they're looking to feel safe. They're looking to feel accomplished. But I think, and Bill, what I heard you say, and I want to echo is that I think our kids come with some baggage and they didn't unpack that baggage. And in and, and, and so many cases, they failed or were led to believe they were failing and they come in kind of wounded. And so they need to unpack that. And they may come in and appear to be a bit of a mess to us but really, it just takes time for them to not try to disappear in every classroom because that worked great when I was in a class of 20 um, or to use, you know, whatever the behaviors were that, that were so complicating. They just need to dis disabuse themselves of those strategies. And it takes a while. But if you ask the teachers and the parents, by and large, they see progress almost immediately. And the kids do too, because as Bill, you said, you know, once they start to feel safe and confident, um, and, and in our case, we have very young children, you know, certainly there are some kids take longer than others, but by and large, I think that is, is the real magic of our schools. Charlie, I think you once said to me when we had this conversation, that um, it was a little bit, it's, it's, a, it's about the trajectory, really. You know, it's about looking at like just the movement over, over time and, um, you know, and, and saying like, okay, like where are we relative to last week? Are, you know, are we coming to school? Are we, you know, are we happy with that? You know, how, and Beth, incidentally, um, Spencer says it's three months. That's the time. That's oh. the number. Okay. okay. He may not be wrong. I'll <laughs> add that to the data. <laughs> Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> I do agree with Jim. I don't think it takes as long as people think. I think it's a little bit like therapy that um, you have to, you have to, the connection has to be there. The student in particular, but the family too, has to sort of see that we get it. And what I mean by get, getting it is that we can connect all the dots, all that information that comes into the admissions process that our director of enrollment and admissions, Sunan Jones, goes through that, that volume of material that sometimes is really hard to digest, but that we can connect the dots and we can understand their kid on the level below the diagnosis. I mean, you have to get the level below that and then the level below that to, to sort of see 
who the core of the child is beyond all the stuff that happens around all the defense structure, all the compensatory strategies, all the challenging behaviors, all of those things, you have to sort of see the core of the child. When the student knows and the parent knows that we could see the core of who their kid really is and what they're struggling with and how those struggles are connected to their challenges and not their diagnosis, I think parents and kids really trust us because that's where the safety, so you build safety from that core knowledge. That's how safety is built. And once you have that, then kids know they're in the right place and parents feel like we're, when their kids come to school, we're gonna take care of them. And also then when there are problems and challenging behaviors, because that's the nature of being in a therapeutic school, the trust is high to begin to have conversations about them. Let me, and let me go back to that trajectory question because I think that progress monitor, continuing monitoring of, of a child's progress, you know, aside from what IEPs mandate, you know, we have that piece of it, mm -hmm. but it, it's really sort of measuring growth against a child's trajectory. And so, you know, we had one, I'll give you an idea, we had one child who is gonna make a great criminal defense attorney. He can argue like no one else uh, I've seen, and he cannot argue with certainly all adults. But as he's begun to trust us and he's begun to sort of allow us to see his vulnerability as core self, there's less of that. So the emotional iterations that he goes through to, to make his point, they're less, the intensity is less, the volume is less, and the ability to come to a place where maybe I'll see tears or the staff will see tears, I think is, is, is more prevalent. That is enormous stress. And that's heartwarming for a family to see when we're at a meeting talking about their son who, because we don't really want to sort of kill his ability to argue and his ability to advocate for himself. That's a great skill. And we want to see that, but in a way that people will really, really hear him. Mm -hmm. I will say that it requires every teacher to be a great therapist. You don't have to have the credentials, but in order to do this kind of work, which is the work of very few people, you have to be not only a great educator, but you have to be a, a, an awesome therapist as well. Absolutely. Maggie? Yeah, I think that's a really great answer. Um, and I think that my answer to this is going to be dependent on, and I mean, obviously I'm coming from fusion, so everything's individualized, but it's going to be on the, the individualized scale where depending on where they've come from, the challenges that they've had, the struggles, maybe failures at other schools, and, you know, their wall might be higher than other students and, and why earning that parent's trust is so important. But I think that we, I think everybody's kind of alluded to this. We follow with the student and the student telling the parents, and I don't mean just verbally, I also mean non-verbally. So I mean, they're getting up and they want to go to school, mm -hmm. that they're standing a little bit taller, that they're willing to have conversations about school. That's when I would say the parents should start to trust us because their kids trust us. And I think that that's, that's probably the most important piece. Wonderful. I mean, you all have touched on um, an interesting um, question, or a couple of you, Jim, um, Charlie, um, have touched on the, in the question of trust. Um, a lot of students, having been failed in other programs, having not you know, had success in other programs, come to you in um, a state of, you know, of, with walls, you know, um, as Maggie alluded to. Um, how do you go about rebuilding trust, not only with the student, you know, but with the family, you know, how do you support that, you know, trust building with communication? What does your communication model look like? And then sort of, you know, the last piece of that is how do you support families, you know, that have continued dealings with their school district team, you know, throughout the course of their time with you? So that's a, that's a big question. Who wants to do that first? You know, I'll jump in first, not yeah. that I'll give the most thorough answer, but I want to go back to the word trust because I had a fun uh, last May for the first time last year, we invited our newly enrolled parents to campus and I teased them right off the bat. I said, let me get this straight. You guys have agreed to pay an impossibly high tuition for a school you've never actually visited. Um, you've never actually met the admissions team. Your child has never been here and you've never met a teacher. 
I'm You're an amazing salesperson. <laughs> <of May>. So <laughs> talk about trust. I looked yeah. at them and I said, listen, you folks, you, you know, you're not acting out of desperation, but you're acting out of faith. And you're trying to find the right school, the right environment. And I'm sure this happened to all of us. Last year was the strangest year I've ever experienced. And yet all these families came to our, our attention, agreed to enroll in our school, but weren't quite sure where we were headed with all that. So we scrambled hard to make sure that they knew um, the cast of characters and all that. And I, I think that by and large, our families were so eager to find a partnership with the school. And I, I can't underscore that word enough that, that we're, we're all about partnerships and we've all used that word tonight. And they're hoping that, you know, we're going to deliver it at every level. So I'll just leave that that image for you of, you know, we have a, a whole new and newly enrolled class of people that didn't have the opportunity to look into this as deeply as they might have, but they did it because they really trusted us. And I think they, they, they trust us because it, it's so difficult when you have a kid who struggles and you're you're in a school that may have understood your other kids and doesn't understand your really smart kid and they come to one of our schools and we begin with that understanding so when you can talk to a family about who their your, their child is and articulate the strengths and their needs and then talk about a program that's designed to remediate those those needs in a way that is not just an IEP, is, is not just a process that's done one time a year and, and that IEP is put on a shelf and truly doesn't represent an actual individualized education program that is designed to really teach those skills. I mean, going back to the, the, the communication piece, it's unbelievably important to continue to let our families know, here's what we're learning about your kid. Yeah. And then going back to, for those of us um, who have you know, you know, Villa and I think Eagle Hill and Pinnacle are both approved private special education programs in the state of, of Connecticut. So when we have district place kids and I'm learning, I, I've got to go back to the district and say, we've got, we're going to rewrite this IEP because here's who we knew. Here's how we know Christine right now. And I'm going to tweak this program. Um, so it's a continual process rather than it just sits on a shelf once. Mm -hmm. So we're helping you through that, that PPT within that PPT meeting. You were holding your hand through that because you're at our school because you know we become experts on your kids, and the public school system may be experts in curriculum, but but they're not experts on on our kids who struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and they don't recognize the skill development that's required in order for students to become successful, yeah, and absolutely. to become engaged partnerships in their education. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, as Jim said, I think you know communication with parents, especially our new parents. Um, our focus program, uh, as Christine's aware, we touch base with parents at least once weekly. Mm -hmm. but at the That's my favorite year, thing. Those emails were my favorite thing. Yeah. I mean, they were just like, you know, everything and, happened, you know, in the week, by class, everything. They were amazing. And they did a lot. That did, that was a lot, um, that had a lot to do with rebuilding my level of trust, you know, with exactly. the school, which I honestly and never thought I'd get back, you know, when, when I, when I ended up on your doorstep. So those emails were a huge part of that for me. And, and that communication from the focus teacher, from deans, from myself, and uh, parents have also commented how that summary, because you know, adolescents aren't always the most forthcoming with information. And that, that, that provides a, 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 a a baseline in which to uh, have topics at dinner. It's like, oh, I heard you're doing really well in science. You did a great experiment this week. And parents said, thank you. I can now, you know, I can initiate a conversation with my child and the shock that I understand what book they're reading and, and how well they're doing and they're working on particular skills and strategies. So, um, and, you know, we talk about the QSO all the time and, and Christine, you know, you're familiar with that, but um, that language um, is utilized at Winston and shared with families that can be utilized at home for that generalization. So I think that develops trust in that we're very transparent. This is what we're working on. Again, we're a solution-based model, skill development model. We're here. We, we're not saying there isn't a problem. Obviously, your child's struggling with something. Um, that's what we're here for. And I think our, as Bill said earlier, I think parents are always impressed how quickly we understand their children, because this is what we do and think all day. This is how we think. This is the lexicon we use. Um, so I think that just, um, you know, parents are always shocked at how much we understand so quickly. 
and that we have, you know, a, a, a toolbox of strategies and, and suggestions for both academic and social emotional challenges that our kids present with in order to make them feel successful so they can be independent and as I said, you know, uh, participants in their education and their lives. And Maggie, you also have an amazing, amazing communication um, model as well. Very similar yeah, in terms we, of that. That's what I was going to comment on. Uh, like you're saying, Beth, we we have communication that goes out daily for every class that a student has. Um, it automatically goes into the parents' inbox at seven o'clock that night, and it's a perfect time for dinner. It's a perfect time for them to talk about the good things that are going on, and they don't have to talk about, oh, did you get your homework done? That cloud's not over them. They can they can control the conversation by starting with something positive. And and exactly like you said, you know that that science quiz that you had, I can't believe you did so well. You know that that's really great. I'm so proud of you and switching the perspective of coming to that dinner table and, and having and interrogating and interrogating. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's on, on the flip side. What I are you doing? Say, <laughs> <laughs> I also have parents still, you know, when they first come to us and I'll call them and I, I try to go out of my way at least once or twice a week to just call a parent to just say one tangible thing that I saw that week that was positive. And I still get the hesitation in the very beginning of because everything okay you know what did Spencer do today no Spencer did actually did something really nice I was really proud of him going out of his way to offer some of his candy to a new student or something like that just to remind them that their students are good and their students are loved and we are paying attention to that and we want you to know too that's wonderful I mean you um you have all kind of you know um moved gradually you know from this communication discussion to you know this you know you know, this discussion of, um, you know, how do we know how our students are doing, you know, um, and how do we know, you know, outside of the IEP, you know, with grades, you know, how our students are doing, what is progress measured by, um, you know, um, several of you have, um, you know, discussed um, that, you know, that process and how, you know, how you, how you measure a student's um, you know, progress. And Charlie, I'd like to start with you on this one. Um, how do you think about progress and, you know, and how students are, are, are measured in this, um, you know, in, in your program? So I think there's several ways to, to measure progress. I think as part of, you know, the majority of our students have IEPs and we have partnerships with districts. And those partnerships are really essential um, to the well-being of the family and, and, and the students. And we could talk more about that as well. So, we, we have to have some quantitative data. So we have to have a good assessment system that progress monitors, especially instructional data, reading, mathematics, those kinds of uh, assessments. So I think that our teachers have to be skilled at progress monitoring and assessments and how to deliver that, that information to parents and districts because that does build hope and trust that a student is moving in, in, the, in the correct direction. I think the other part of it is the social emotional data because all of our students have either primary or secondary social emotional challenges. And some of them have risen to significant mental health challenges as a result of skills that they've not been able to acquire and as a result of other problems that they have not been able to adequately resolve. So we have to capture the growth of students, social emotional growth, because it doesn't, it doesn't help to say you, you have there's the absence or presence of some mental health disorder. That really doesn't help to understand children. That's just the surface stuff that we capture to, to, to qualify students for, for special education. So we have to find ways to do that. And the model that we use is the model that Ross Green out of Harvard developed, which is the collaborative and proactive solutions, because it's a model that captures the ability to sort of track the development of lagging skills and track the development of problems that have yet to be, to be solved. That kind of information and being able to sort of deliver that to parents and districts provides them hope where they have lost hope uh, and faith that anything can be done with their, their, their child. So that kind of progress monitoring data, I think is really important, but probably as important as how we communicate it. So we don't sound like the, the typical sound bites that parents have heard before that have really in some way they have felt betrayed. And I think that's where I think building trust and hope with families. So when we present data, they don't see it as some form of bureaucracy that really kind of passes their kids through, but as a way to provide meaningful information for them to understand their, their children in, in, in a different way. 
Jim, why don't you, um, you know, you weigh in on um, Eagle Hill's outlook on progress and progress monitoring and, uh, and how you look at the students' development over time. You don't use a great yeah, well, system, I, as, I, as I recall, so. Yeah, well, uh, Charlie really uh, did a great job in identifying the sort of dashboard instruments that we all are, are duty bound to, to be watching. And, and certainly the academic dashboard presents itself perhaps as the most important, at least that's what brought a lot of families to our school. And, you know, I think Eagle Hill, I don't think, I know they do a particularly good job in personal assessments. Now, we are a state-approved school. We also, you know, we're somewhat duty-bound to follow IEPs. And as Charlie said, sometimes to rewrite them and, and to reinvent them. And we do that based on evidence, based on, you know, good, good data collection. But I think it goes much further than just uh, that particular dashboard instrument. I, any, any of the work that we do in their social emotional lives, um, which is why I think you know, music and art and athletics are so critical to talk about student government uh, debates will happen on our campus tomorrow. All that stuff, the assembly, the newscast, these are absolutely critical. And I think over time, our parents really learn to, to recognize that they're just as important as the needle moving on math or reading skills. Um, you know, I, I'm particularly proud of Eagle Hill's capacity to do that. And when it comes to placement, um, you know, and placing students out, the, the ability to articulate for the school, uh, we go up through roughly eighth grade. And so when we're placing students and we have a dedicated position now at our school for what we're calling a district facilitator, because about a third of our students go right back to their public schools, the ability to articulate and describe the progress they've made and try to find the right fit and help families is really critical. Um, so I, I'm particularly proud of our, of our progress on that front. And I'm sure each of you in your own special ways uh, cover the same territory. Beth, would you like to, um, I mean, I have a, you know, a, a deep and um, intimate knowledge of the CUSL and uh, in all of its glory, um, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you use that to make, because it does have that, that really interesting component of, you know, of student um, involvement in the, in the mm -hmm. evaluative process. Um, you know, Winston, we're about skill acquisition towards independence, and that's both uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, that skill development coupled with the QSIL, which Christine is speaking of, which is the qualities of a sustainable and independent learner. And uh, there are eight characteristics uh, that include advocacy, self-awareness, uh, self-regulation, um, effective communication, time management and organization, um, I think I mentioned resilience. And those are uh, characteristics that you know, are, are, are targeted and infused into the student school day as well. Uh, and, and those are also characteristics that, you know, you have to talk about it when it happens. It, it's not something, um, you, you know, that you can teach a child. It, it, it's, it's, it's gotta be organic. And at Winston, it's an organic moment of, oh, you're being, you know, being resilient, you're not being resilient. And how can we help you become more resilient? Um, uh, Christine, speaking of, uh, we have students also uh, self-rate, um, in those categories. And of course, they always uh, often give themselves very high scores. Um, and then teachers rate as well. And there's often a discrepancy. And, and then you'll see teachers sitting in the hallway or in the focus rooms talking um, with students about, you know, how do you get better at advocacy? Let's, let's have you ask a question in a class. You determine which class that is. And then, you know, we go from, okay, well, you're doing a great job asking questions in literature. Let's now, let's add another class. And the next thing you know, now students are taking risks because they feel comfortable and, and, and um, they feel that uh, they're in an environment where they can take those risks, risks because again, they're understood. Um, I think that, you know, it's important to recognize that I think um, all of our schools, certainly at Winston, um, you know, we, we, we are targeting, um, as I said, there's a we're a solution-based model, we're a skill development model, and it's all about you know student participation, independence. Um, we had our transitions and uh, transcripts presentation last night to our families regarding uh, those next steps post Winston, and what does that look like? So we're always preparing, and we're talking about that trajectory of success, and how do we continue the success that we've provided our students um, so that they can continue to be independent. And I think that's, that's why when you know, we talk about sticker shock, 
Um, you know, you're receiving a tremendous amount of communication, support, understanding. Students are feeling a member of a community. Many of our students have never felt that way. Um, and they're feeling successful and able to take risks. And, um, you know, we're, we're providing that now so that when they leave us, they can be successful, independent young adults um, versus, you know, what does that look like later when they don't, they, they leave the school without those skills. Um, you know, the investment is now. And I think that's how our families uh, view Winston and um, the schools that are here on the panel as well. Um, this is an investment in your child that's going to help their future and help them with, um, you know, the, the struggling readers become readers and the kids with NDLD to become more uh, flexible in their thinking and, and, and uh, engage in, in, in the social interaction and students with executive function and who are so capable, how do we get them to initiate and complete tasks so they can be successful individuals. Um, so I think that's really, uh, you know, a whole programmatic view, but that's, that's the difference and that's what we measure. We measure how are our students, are they becoming more independent? And we have formal measures. Um, we test our students annually with um, the WISC. We do uh, reading measure support, gates McGinnity testing, but there's also that very informal approach as well, because we know our students so intimately. Bill, you want to take this? Sure. I, I don't know how much more I, I have to offer. This has been, you know, I, I agree with everything. You know, I, I I just checked one of the questions that came on the side. And I, if, I, if it's okay, I'm going to tie it in. It was a yeah, question sure. about are our, our programs, how do, how do families know that our programs aren't a watered down main version of mainstream? And I think that your question about assessment and how do we know what we know answers this because I don't think that any of us have a watered down mainstream curriculum. We're about looking at independence. When students arrive at our school, we have to be already be thinking, what does that independence look like? And it looks different for every kid, depending on whether they have decoding issues or social pragmatic issues, but we have to be looking towards that independence. And in order to do that, we have to be assessing all the time. So those formative assessments that are built in are assessing the skills that we're teaching. So it's not about, in a, in a mainstream school, it's about delivering content. It's about the, the seventh grade social studies curriculum. And instead we're talking, we're, we're, we're talking about reading skills and writing skills and, and problem solving skills and social emotional skills and, and, and we're that assessing question. those yeah at, right and, and that's we can teach those specific skills all good teachers do this but but our emphasis is on the teaching of those skills and we can do that in that content so it's it's not watered down at all mm -hmm. we may not cover what, what is outlined for a seventh grade social studies curriculum, but our kids are developing those skills to, to navigate a nonfiction textbook, to take notes from that textbook, to highlight, take a test, to organize all that information. Those are essential skills. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's, and yeah, and so that's, and we're, we have to assess those. We have the form of, we have the summit of assessments, the, the public schools too, but, but we take this one step further because we're, we're basing our programs on those assessments. And not, not, we're, we're not deciding how good our school is based on those assessments. No, yeah. we're teaching our kids how to learn, not necessarily just what to learn. To learn. And, absolutely. Right. and I think that's what's so important. That's a great reason to look at it. I, uh, to that, Christine, because I think it's such a key point, is the focus is on, on teaching the skill development, because I, I, I do agree with, you know, with, uh, with what Beth and, and Bill are saying, because the issue is, we want our kids to, to see themselves as learners, and that's something that they have not seen. And if we teach them curriculum, they're still not seeing themselves as the, the, having the capacity to learn, whether it's a social emotional skill or whether it's an academic or underlying skill, skill like processing speed, that it, we're teaching that they are capable to learn so they see themselves as someone who can go through the learning process. I think that's different than taking in the curriculum and kind of regurgitating it back. And yeah. responding well, to but, their response, right? Yeah, Navigating absolutely. and responding to their response consistently. Mm -hmm. I mean, Maggie, you have a different perspective because your program allows you to kind of move however at spe the speed that the student, you know, is able to move at, you know, so that, you know, really, you know, I mean, for you kind of obviates that, you know, that, that question. 
Yeah, and it's actually a question I get all the time about measurable outcomes because we can uh, individualize and personalize the curriculum. We, when a student comes to us, we we start with our measures of academic progress. We start with our map in in English uh, reading comprehension. We understand their Lexile score and we get you know their math continuum. What do they know? What don't they know? And where do we start with them? But when we work within the classroom, we're we're still working within the standards and a curriculum. But the way in which we teach it, we can or incorporate things that they're actually interested in, to, to bring that engagement in, that they may, you know, once we start to speak their language and they start to feel comfortable with us and trust us, that when we're measuring our outcomes, we're interweaving that their own language into it. So, you know, when we're, we're reading with them, the reading material, we want to consider their interests. We want to personalize it because like we were talking about before with trust, we want to hang on to their trust and say, we hear you. And here I, you know, went out of my way to bring this into our lesson plan um, so that, you understand how much I want you to be engaged in this. So on, on one stance, when we're measuring outcomes in the academic sense, we have our, our, our testing that happens every fall mm -hmm. and spring, and we're measuring the growth in that capacity. But like everybody else is saying, we also want to measure the growth of them in student government, in the National Honor Society, when they go to volunteer activities, when they, you know, find their voice and sing a song in our recording studio and they express themselves. You know, outcomes for our students really are, it's, it's across the board. We want to look at them as a, a whole person and not just at their academics or their reading level or, or their math continuum. There's so much more than that. Um, and within the one to one, we get to unpack that. You know, we're very fortunate in that capacity to have families that trust us and put them in, put their children in, in our care and in our hands and trust that we're going to get to know them and what measurable outcome for each individual, um, we're going to figure that out. We do also have goal setting quarterly and we involve the student in that too. So we have our pillars, our, um, our four different pillars, independent critical thinking, emotionally secure, resourceful individual and compassionate. And we're asking our students to rate themselves on that. And I, somebody had mentioned it before that they, they're going to, you know, score themselves a little bit higher. And when teachers get together, or a lot higher in our specific instance. examples. <laughs> Exactly. Um, yeah, and, and we have follow up conversations. They're not just arbitrary goals that we set for them. We're constantly talking about them week, week in and week out, and making sure that they understand that these aren't just goals that we set that we want for them that they have a voice in that in that part of their education as well. Wonderful. I hope we all got to answer that I'm kind of losing track of, um, of where we are. Um, the um, I want to talk a little bit about um, where your students, how, so this was the second question, which I was going to ask earlier, the, the two parents that the two questions that parents come in to your community wanting to know the first is how long it's going to take you to get to know their student. The second is how long is my student going to be here? And, um, that's a question, obviously, that, you know, um, you know, many students will go back to a, a, you know, a district environment, many students will go to a different, you know, kind type of program, but, you know, on balance, you know, how long do students um, stay with you in your program? Can I, can I, can I answer that question? Because I think it's a, there's a two part to that. I think one of it is the, the, the building of trust with the districts. I think that that's really key and I'll come back to why I think that's, that's so important. I think that what I've learned, and I guess because I've sat in the other chair as a district director, is that we, we have not in the time that I've been at Pinnacle, we've not had a time where there's ever been a disagreement about when a child should go back to their home district, right? Um, and, and that I think is important because the trust that you build with the district, and you do that through a lot of ways, through obviously showing that the child is making growth in all the measures that, that right. you know, all my esteemed colleagues have, have mentioned, but there's never been a disagreement about when a child should go back or, or go back at all to, the, to a district school. And that I think is noteworthy because that reduces the fear that parents have, especially in the first few years, that a district will, will sort of force their child back into a place that they don't feel safe and they haven't had success. I think that's an important- They're not ready for. And they're, they're not ready for. They're not ready for. I also think as, I guess as I've, I've, I've grown older, that change takes time. And change can happen on one level, but it has to be internalized and solidified at another level. So there, you know, there's different levels of change. And sometimes what we're measuring, we're measuring somewhat of a surface level, and we're not measuring sort of the deep embedded levels of growth 
that really kids need in order to feel successful, to feel that they're competent learners, that they can handle the struggles that life throws at them. And those kinds of challenges need to kind of be uh, grown over time. And sometimes you don't see them, you see aspects of them like the tip of the iceberg and you're not seeing the bottom of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. I think those are variables too that have to be spoken about and articulated to districts and parents, but it's the trust that helps the district believe that in fact that that occurs. But I, I don't think it's a short process. And if I had to put a number on it, which I don't really like because I think it's it's kind of uh, it's part of a guess. Individualized. I would, yeah. I would say that probably three years is not an unusual amount of time for kids to cons to develop skills, consolidate those skills, and feel uh, stronger. But I, I don't think there's a number that you can apply to. I think you have to look at all of those variables. I do think it's important, you know, for you know parents to realize you know, that when you're moving from one environment to another, that, and I know this from my own personal experience, is that, you know, sometimes a child needs to be pushed a little bit. You know, sometimes when you're looking at like the new environment, the new school, you know, you don't know if it's going to work, you know, and I know I've had that experience myself, you know, um, you know, several times where you're, you know, you're like, I don't know if my child is going to succeed here because I don't know how he's gonna to take to the environment and to the supports that are embedded in the system. And then as you start to peel those away, you know, how's he gonna do in the next place? But I do feel, I do believe that, you know, um, the next step should always be a little bit of a push for the kid in order to grow. Cause that's kind of how we, how we grow. Christine. Uh, let me add to that, uh, the question about how long. Um, I'm not, you know, Eagle Hill, like all our schools, and, and Charlie said it so well, we're never opposed to the idea and we're willing to have the conversation and we're open to it. But we've invested in, you know, we've defined a mission for our schools and our mission usually begins with what are the ages we serve and, and you know, what, what are we all about? And so in the case of Eagle Hill, we're kindergarten through eighth grade. And, and if students and families desire to be there for the full breadth of that or some portion of that journey, um, we've invested a lot of time and effort to create a true K to eight experience with all the logical progressions through the different stages of childhood through early, early adolescence. You know, at Beth school, I'm sure they don't aspire to come just for ninth grade so they can go to somewhere else for 10th grade. You know, I would like to think our kids see this as the whole package and our families see it. And then there may be very compelling reasons why they need to, to make a shift. And again, as Charlie said, I don't think any of us are, are going to say, no, no, no. You know, the deal was right to, to the classic graduation threshold. That, that's not what we're about. But I, 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 um, I, I no, we've been, you know, again, back to the lead question of the night, you know, what are we, what are you really purchasing when you subscribe to our schools? You're, you're subscribing to the whole package. It wasn't an a la carte menu that brought you there. So I'll just leave that thought out there and let no, others absolutely. comment. I think that's, that, those are great points. I think, Charlie, you know, you're so correct and there's so many variables, but I think, you know, students have to, we feel comfortable when students transition. Um, if you know they, they're generalized the skills, and I spoke earlier about the QCIL, and they have you know we look at those that self awareness, that advocacy, that problem solving, that time management, are those skills there? Um, Winston's Innovation Lab has several initiatives, and one of those is a Lives Over Time study, and, um, and we follow our kids that have graduated and, and uh, left Winston, and they all refer to that qualities of a sustainable and independent learner. They said, yeah, that's what makes them successful where they go because they, they have the skills, they have the academic skills, but they also have that awareness of problem solving and advocacy because that th those are the skills. I always say those aren't Winston skills, those are life skills. <laughs> um, and, and that's what we try to teach our children that this isn't just what you know, we think is good for you here. This is what you need to succeed elsewhere. So uh, sometimes kids say, I want to stay. This is where my friends are. I like my teachers. I'm taking college level courses through Landmark's um, high school partnership program. You know, and, and, some, and if a family can make that work, then sure, we'll have students remain. But there are variables that go into that. Um, and certainly uh, economics is one of them. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, uh, you know, we all touched on how important communication is with our families and keeping that communication for us. It's 
when I first meet the family, what are, what are the goals? What would you like to see out of your child right now? And sometimes it's, I need to get my, my child to school every day. I want them. Sometimes it's, I need to build their confidence. I need them to get re-engaged with their learning, you know, and that, that might take more time to, as we earn their trust and they open up and they start to engage with the material and engage with the teachers and the longevity of their time at fusion is really dependent on the goals of the family. And, you know, you just mentioned this Beth, but also what are we seeing from the student? Are they ready to, and that constant communication of, are they meeting these benchmarks that we have set for them at our school on? Are they practicing being a resourceful individual? Are they compassionate? Are they critical thinkers, you know, and, and, and how does that show up and communicating that and making sure Sure that our families know that you know if it's not in our best in, or if it's not in the best interest to, to make a radical change at this point um you know having those honest conversations and, and from a disarming way and just saying you know it, it's our advice that we if this is the path that you want to go that we interweave these different supports to help build those skills so that they're better prepared or they may need one more year and that this next year is focused on these skills so that that transition is more successful Perfect. I don't think I have much more except, you know, we're always working towards it, our kids not needing us anymore. Again, going back to everything we've said tonight, if, if we, if we're, we're it's just like parenting. Us, it's just like parenting. Well, absolutely. We're leading towards independence. We don't want your kids on, on your couch at 18. You know, what do we need to do in order to get them off the couch and independent and successful? And I think the length of stay truly depends on the kids. And again, what Maggie said, what are their goals and why are they with us? You know, if I, and the younger we get some of our kids, if I have a, a first grader who has executive functioning struggles, who just needs to, to learn that self-regulation and learning how to learn, I can bring him back into, into his, you know, home district in, in third or fourth grade. But someone coming to us in, in fifth or sixth grade with, with a nonverbal learning disability, with, with, with real social pragmatic struggles, they, they're going to be with us through eighth grade probably. Mm -hmm. And it just is going to depend on the right. kid. It depends on when they when they come in. Yeah. Um, so I thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I'm going to end um, on this last question, um, which is, you know, those of you that know me well know that um, I am a big believer in the idea that um, in order for an independent school of any kind to be successful, they have to know who their student is. So can each of you describe for me your student in three words or less? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Who wants to go first? Nobody? Three words? Three words, yeah. I mean, I could have done five, but that would have been too easy. Yeah, that's hard. Um, that's a great question. The, the, they the struggle word? in school. I mean, I, I mean <laughs> without getting specific, they, they, they struggle, say, in, you know, there, there's my three words, struggle in school. Misunderstood they, often. <laughs> um, <laughs> so too, misunderstood, uh, eager. I think many of them were eager. Yeah, um, absolutely. Or motivated, I'd say misunderstood, motivated, not, you know, it, it all depends. I have um, a parent, a panelist or a, pa a parent chiming in with underestimated. Absolutely. Underestimated, that's perfect, yes. Under, misunderstood, underestimated. Yeah, we'll go with underestimated, um, you know, willing, eventually, parentheses, gonna put parentheses. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm gonna say good souls, but that's two words. They're good. Yeah, people. I would say yeah. they're good kids. Not not give it up. That is yeah. neither the family or the kid. I would say yeah. if I had to use three words, but that's really hard for me. Not give it up. That is they 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 continue to to have hope that there's oh, a place oh. out there that they can be successful. So I guess those are the three words for me. I just saw somebody put in the chat resilient. resilient that was the first yeah. thing I wrote down. Yeah, yeah I, I think that they've they've been through the ringer, but they're still here and they're showing up. And um, I put empathetic too, empathetic and open, um, where maybe it's not coming out. That's not the first quality that you see in them. But as soon as they meet a peer or make a connection with a teacher, that empath really, really comes out um, and their openness to growth. 
Well, you guys have succeeded in making every one of my words. And uh, so I wrote, I jotted down very quickly, empathetic, um, eager, and hopeful, because I think you guys nailed it. That's what our kids want more than anything. And they are surprisingly empathetic. That has been really demonstrated to me in the most wonderful ways. I think resilient, um, you know, just, you know, chiming back in on, um, you know, Maggie's comment and the comment from one of the parents is, um, you know, there's really no child um, that's more resilient than one that has had to go to school in an environment that is not supporting them day after day and try to make it work and still keep going. Like that is a, that's a resilient child. That's a child that like just keeps, you know, pushing on. So um, I thank you all so much for joining us to all of our panelists, to Bill, Beth, Maggie, um, Charlie and Jim. This was a great, um, I hope you guys had fun. I certainly did. Um, I only asked like a 10th of my questions. So obviously you're all gonna have to come back and we'll do this again um, another time without my missing, um, hopefully with an actual PowerPoint presentation at the start this time. But uh, thank you all so much for joining us. This presentation will be recorded and available on Facebook and on our webpage, our um, www.spedlegalfund.org. And don't forget about our next um, webinar on November 17th, which is understanding outplacement. I know there were a couple of questions about the outplacement process, which we will address um, in this panel with special education attorneys who will go very, very in depth and detailed into the process by how of, of how a student would secure an outplacement to an independent yeah. special education school through their district. So thank you all very much. Um, it was great to have you and you. Um, have a great night. Thank, thank you, you, Christine. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good to see you all. Be safe and well. Thanks, Christine.